This is a picture of a Roman legionary, you know. Uh, these are the guys who went and fought against other countries. So, so there was a Roman guard that used to protect Caesar. And this is the Roman legionary that used to go and make war with other nations. So Paul had someone like this in mind who would go and fight against other countries. And uh, so we, we looked, we started off with the belt. Yeah, and today we'll talk about some other things. But before that, uh, let me just again uh, give an overview of Ephesians. Ephesians was a letter that Paul had written in prison. And uh, in Ephesians, he presents the wealth of the believer, the walk of the believer, and the warfare of the believer. And he says, because of the wealth that has come to us through the cross, we have to be having a walk that uh, honors Christ, and there has to be, and there is, we have to be effective in the war that is there. And it all is there because first a wealth has been provided to us, a gift has been given to us that empowers us to be effective in our walk and in our warfare. Yeah. And um, then we'll go to Ephesians chapter 6, where there's a lot of focus on the warfare aspect. We've I've spoken so many sermons to you on warfare. And uh, now we've come to this whole area of the armor. And uh, so Ephesians chapter 6. And we see uh, from verse 10 onwards, Ephesians 6 verse 10. All right. Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of His might. Put on the full armor of God. See, it's not enough to have the armor supplied through the success of Calvary. We have to put it on. Put on the full armor of God that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. So it's very clear we have a devil and a team that is always scheming against us. The devil is not a fool. He studies us well. There are tailor-made attacks for people. It's not He's not a random character that we think. There are tailor-made attacks. He studies. He knows the weaknesses. He knows which <laughs> buttons to press. And so, he, so, so they as a team, they, they have a whole department, they scan, they make plans and then they attack. So, so it's very important that uh, we, are, we cannot be ignorant of the schemes of the devil. We have an enemy, yeah, we have uh, many enemies. Uh, Arun mentioned one, the flesh, then we have the devil and his team and we have the world system. But right now, let's talk about this fellow devil and his team. So he's always scheming against us. Yeah? And uh, let's understand this. It's a very highly organized team that the devil has, okay? They are not random, they are not foolish, they are very well organized and as I said, they study the believers and they are tailor-made attacks that are carried out, okay? So, um, so we need to be aware of that, okay? And then we are told why we need to put on the armor, yeah? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, powers, world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in every places. So a war is not against people. It's not against the boss. It's not against the, the neighbor who troubles you for parking. Yeah, it's, it's, it's against forces of darkness, spiritual forces of wickedness. The beings without bodies who are at work and the, uh, demons are there. They can, you know, uh, put thoughts into your mind and you, and you can think it is, it is your own thoughts, but, but demons can actually put thoughts into our mind. And even we can think it's our thoughts, but they're not. And we have to learn. We don't meditate on our thought until you identify its source. And only the Holy Spirit is the one who can make us, who can empower us to recognize the difference. Who's speaking? Is it my thought? It is, is, it, is it the devil in his team? Who's talking to me? Yeah. All right. So, again, he says, therefore, because you have this rulers and powers and world forces of wickedness, spiritual forces of wickedness and places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day. And having done everything, you stand firm. Mm. Evil day. Interesting, right? The more you grow in the Lord, the more you'll find new intensity of battle. Yeah. Mm. The more victories you have, the more you will find greater intensity of battles come. <coughs> and we have to recognize this. And, and it's not that, you know, uh, God enjoys troubling us. No, it's, He loves us so much. He wants to, he wants to strengthen our spiritual muscles. And uh, he, he knows how much we can handle and better if you just turn to Him. But He wants to strengthen us. Yeah? And the bigger the, the, bigger the, the problem, the, the, the bigger the test, the greater the testimony, right? Can we say that? The greater the test, the greater the testimony. We see in the scriptures, whenever God wanted to exalt uh, a man or a woman, 
He allowed big tests in their life. And that's how he exalted them. So we see, for example, in the case of, I've, I've, I've mentioned so many times, to, I've, you know, when you look at this guy, Hezekiah, we are told that after these acts of faithfulness, Sennacherib came and besieged the city. Now, when you do acts of faithfulness, you don't expect a wicked king to come and attack you. You expect rewards and awards from God. But that's how God rewards you. Yeah? When you are doing well, the Lord allows bigger things to come to you. So that when you beat that, everybody knows, man, this guy's God is big. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, if, if, you know, David became famous because he killed Goliath. Yeah? He caught the eye of everybody. So, when God wants to exalt his people, he allows bigger things. And also through the whole process, he shows us a bigger picture of himself. It is in the war, through the war, that we see a bigger picture of God. We see how big he really is. Psalm 23 says that the Lord will prepare a table for me in the presence of my enemies. It's in the presence of enemies, then the prepared table is very sweet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then he says, okay, stand firm therefore, verse 14, having girded your lands with truth. And we talked about the belt of truth. Can you show the, can you show my Roman legionary please? Yeah, so here is this fellow's belt of truth. Yeah. And I said to you, you know, this is a long flowing tunic, not the shirt that I'm wearing. They had these long flowing tunics. And a belt was necessary to hold things together. And I said to you that it is truth that firms us up and holds us together. And this belt of truth has to do with you being honest with God. You be strong in the truth about God's character, light about his character his ways, and also dealings with people. You are honest, you are transparent, authentic. You don't play games with people, you don't manipulate. It's very important, honesty is important, is, is, is a big deal with God. But you know, in the world, the whole world around us trains us, <coughs> almost encourages us to be shrewd and smart and manipulative. On the other hand, if you see the word of God, God encourages us to be honest, he encourages us to be authentic, he encourages us to be who we are. <laughs> and it is truth that holds us together. It firms you. You're on a, you, you know, when you walk in truth, you're on a sure, sure, sure solid ground. Hallelujah. And today I want to talk about the breastplate. And so here we see the breastplate. On the, okay. And um, so can you take me back now to my verse, please? Brijesh, thank you. So... Yeah. So, first we talked about the, the belt of truth and now put on the breastplate of righteousness. You need a breastplate to protect your heart. And it's called the breastplate of righteousness. And um, Proverbs tells us that above all else you must guard our heart. From it flow the springs of life. And so if you go to Proverbs chapter 4. And just give me a moment. Yeah, verse four twenty three. Watch over your heart with all diligence. Is this any NSBS? Okay. Watch over your heart with all diligence. From it flows the springs of life. So, you know, the heart being, being washed is very important. And we need this best plate of righteousness. Yeah. It's a big problem when I am pers I'm a person walking in self-righteousness. I'm a very easy target for the enemy. But when I realize that my righteousness comes by faith, in Christ. His, his righteousness has been imputed to because of my faith. And I get a right standing with God because of this gift of righteousness. That stabilizes me. That protects me so much. 
you know um so many times I, you know especially when i've been with younger believers i found that so sometimes when they make a mistake they feel they've lost their salvation or they feel i can't now go to church i can't face god what's going on there is a lack of understanding of they don't they have not put on the breastplate of righteousness we don't we didn't get this salvation by good works so you can't lose it by bad works <laughs> the salvation came as a gift to us we are saved by grace through faith not because of works that we should boast so yes we god wants us to learn how to grow in dealing with sin and sinful issues and at the same time even as we are being trained by the holy spirit there times we make mistakes we can make we can sin but that doesn't mean that you lose your salvation that doesn't mean that god's favor is withdrawn from you or you've lost your access with god now you didn't get this access by your own good works you can't lose it by your own bad works the access came to you because of your faith in the gospel hallelujah hallelujah and so so if so the only way to overcome guilt and shame that the devil tries to bring when we sin oh you need this breastplate protecting your heart we need this and we are told that this is a righteousness that comes to us by faith and a gift it's not something that you work up and this this gift of righteousness is what gives you access a bold access to god you got a right standing with god god looks at you and he looks at the righteousness of his own son on you and so we can fellowship with him we can have access to this god we can boldly access god yeah and and very often we are told that once you have now met with christ now don't you to self righteousness what is self righteousness where we secretly think there is some virtue in me that i am that i am made acceptable to god i heard people say that there must be something good in me that god is using me now that's something wrong there in fact god has god has chosen the foolish things yeah of the world to shame the wise so so this is this is something wrong with our theology when if we say that god must have seen something good in me that he is using me no god chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise on the contrary so if you didn't get this access to god through your good works you can lose it with your bad works and so god doesn't want us to feel guilt and shame if you make a mistake there is a way one john tells us if you have sinned what do you do you can confess your sin and what happens god is faithful righteous to forgive you and cleanse you of all unrighteousness there is there is always that open door hallelujah 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 Now, um it's interesting paul also calls this breastplate a breastplate of faith and love and he gives us more understanding about this breastplate so if you go to 1 thessalonians 5 8 please 1 thessalonians 5 8 but since we are of the day let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love and as a helmet the hope of salvation so what's happening here paul you just said sometime back it's a breastplate of righteousness now why are you calling it a breastplate of faith and love <laughs> you get this righteousness of god by faith so it's a breastplate of faith <laughs> you get this righteousness of christ by what by faith you can't work it up we can't earn it <laughs> this righteousness is is applied to us by faith in the gospel hallelujah so paul is reminding us this breastplate is given by faith in the gospel hallelujah so it's a, so he says this we have a breastplate of faith and love paul says in in one place keep yourself in the love of christ what he's saying don't yield to bitterness and resentment against people don't yield to resentment bitterness and forgiveness against people <laughs> walk in the love of god walk clean walk in the love of god so what does this do a breastplate of faith and love what does it do it protects the heart from yielding to negativity 
resentment, bitterness, and righteousness. And in one place, Paul says that in Christ, circumcision, uncircumcision is nothing. What matters is faith working through love. Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Paul says one place, in Christ, circumcision or not being circumcised is nothing. Mm. But what matters is faith yes. working through love. Hallelujah. 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 So, it is very important that we take time to fellowship with God over how I have got this gift of righteousness. Hallelujah. It's very important. We need to talk to the Lord about it. Lord, help me to see that there is nothing, no good virtue in me that I have right standing with you. But it is because of the work of another that I am justified in your presence. You accept me freely because I put my faith in your son and you applied his righteousness to me. And then we make use of the access. This robes of righteousness upon us. What has it done? It has opened a door and given us access to the whole provisions that the cross has made available. It's like imagine the, the gift of righteousness is like a door which you open, a, an open door by which you enter and now you can grab a hold of all the glorious provisions the cross has made available for you. Hallelujah. And in Romans in one place Paul says we will reign in this life through the gift of righteousness and abundance of grace. grace. If there is no gift of righteousness, there is no access to take grace. Yeah? So, we reign in this life through the gift of righteousness and abundance of grace. The gift of righteousness opens the door for you to keep drawing near boldly to the throne of grace so that you will meet with mercy and find grace for help in the time of need. Hallelujah. What is grace? It is not just unmerited favor. Grace is also the reigning power of God that makes you overpower things, that makes you overcome things. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so this is so precious. Um, when Paul opens up more about the best prayer in in this verse and tells us it's a best spirit of faith and love and how much it protects our heart. Yeah, hallelujah. You know, the key verse of the book of Romans is in the first chapter itself of Romans. And if you go there with me, let's read it. Romans 1. Okay, Romans 1, 16 and 17, this is the key verse of the book of Romans. The whole book of Romans, this is the key verse of the book of Romans. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. So this is the theme verse, you can say, of the book of Romans. And, you know, it took me quite a while to understand this verse 17. For in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. This righteousness is revealed from faith to faith. As is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Because of the fall, we were incapable of having fellowship with God. God had to graciously do something that he could plug us back in, back in this fellowship. Yeah, So God had to, God sent his own son as a man, put our sins on him, crushed him. And now we are told that if you put your faith in this son, you are not crushed for your sins, but you receive forgiveness because he has been punished. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so, through our faith in the cross, the very righteousness of God is applied to us. The very righteousness of Christ is applied to us. We are able to access this holy God. And because of this access, as I said to you, the gift of righteousness has opened up access to the very presence of God. And as you make use of that access, and as you keep drinking grace, you will find that good works are being now worked out in your life, not through your willpower, but through the work of the Holy Spirit at work in you. This gospel, in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. 
it's not just enough that the faith of Christ, the, it's not just enough that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to us or applied to us. It's also important that righteous works are now manifesting through your life, in my life, by the power of the Holy Spirit at work in us. You know, the whole world talks about, let's do the smartest thing in the situation. But for the believer, God is always wanting us to do the right thing. Do the right thing which is consistent with his character and his ways as revealed in the scriptures. We are not called to do, but, hey man, figure out the smartest thing to do and do it. We are not called to do that. We are called, we are called to do the right thing in, in every situation. <coughs> and by right I mean, right which is right and consistent with his revealed character and his ways. And so, and so God is looking for, because I imputed my righteousness to you through faith, and I gave you that access, now I want you to make use of that access and let the Holy Spirit work so much in you that now good works are being produced through you to my glory. And they're produced not by your willpower, but they're produced by you learning to walk in harmony with the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And James said, if you claim to be a believer, but you don't have good works, he said, I have, a, I have a problem accepting you as a believer. What was his point? He was not saying, you need good works to be saved. He was saying, if you are genuinely saved, the evidence will be good works. Hallelujah. The point is, if you met with Christ, you can't comfortably live in continual sin. It's impossible. It's impossible. And so James was saying that the evidence of a saving faith is good works worked out because of the Holy Spirit at work in you. That's an evidence that you're genuinely saved. He's saying, James wasn't saying you need good works to be saved, no. He was saying, you're saved, it's a gift. Because you put your faith in the gospel. But if you're genuinely saved, then, he, then, then James was saying, there has to be an evidence. And the evidence is good works, right decisions, being worked out because the Holy Spirit is at work in you now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And I say to you many times, the, smart, the smartest thing to do might help you the short term. But in the long term, it is going to be not in the smart thing, but the right thing. What is right and consistent, the revealed character of God, consistent with the ways of God, as shown in the scriptures. Hallelujah. So, I hope and pray that that will help you. Now, let's go to the, let's go to the next uh, part of the armor. Let's go back to Ephesians, um, Brijesh. Ah. And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Hmm. The Roman soldier, he, ha he, you know, he would have a sandal, a strong sandal, and there was a leather strap which would go up to half of his calf to give a good grip, so that he has mobility and he has availability to his commander. Yeah? Imagine if um, you're sleeping in your tent and the enemy attacks you and you don't have shoes on. <laughs> you will waste a lot of time figuring out where your shoes are, wearing your shoes and then running. So God expects us to always have our shoes on. But what shoes are these? Have on your, you know, have you, on your feet, you need to have the shoes up. Preparation for the gospel of peace. Lord, I don't like this word preparation. Yeah, we want everything in God to be spoon feed me, Lord. Spoon feed. I'll work very hard in the office, but when it comes to my journey with God, spoon feed me, Prabhu. I have so much problem, I have so much headache in office and everything. I have to work so hard in office. At least in the faith, matters of faith, spoon feed me, Lord. But the word preparation doesn't sound spoon feeding to me. It sounds work, right? Preparation, prepare. This, the shoes need some preparation.
He wants us to have some preparation for these shoes. It's called the shoes of the gospel of peace. He wants us to have shoes on. But he says you've got to prepare. Really, simply what it is is we need to take pains to be able to present our testimony effectively and we should be able to share the gospel message effectively. We should not be fumbling when the opportunities come. I say to you, very often we fumble when the opportunities come because we've never, we have never worked on this thing. There's a preparation that is needed. God wants us to put some thought with our testimony. God wants us to put some thought about how I'll share the gospel message when the opportunities come. I need to, be, I need to have clarity about my story and his story. Yeah? I need to have clarity about my story and his story. In the book of Acts, Paul talks about, you know, he shares the gospel. And it just takes him three minutes to share the gospel. If you read it, it looks very long. But actually, if you, if you read it, it takes three minutes. And he packs in so much stuff in three minutes. That's amazing. You know, very often, I found, especially in a metro train, or I found that the opportunity comes to share when people are getting, getting off the train. First, we, first people do all the PC. We do all the polite conversations. And sometimes, you know, people just somehow, just before they're getting off, they get the boldness to ask you why, you know, you're a Christian when you have a Hindu name or why you're a pastor. What is, why, why you left your high-paying job, you know. So generally for me, these questions come right when people are getting off. Perhaps they feel it's easier to run off <laughs> by asking such questions. And you were wanting to share the, the, you know, the real deal the whole time. But they give you the opportunity when it's goodbye time. And then we fumble. We don't know what to say. We've never put thought. We need to prepare. We need to prepare to share our testimony well and to share the gospel message well. And we have to learn how to do it in 10 minutes, 5 minutes, 3 minutes, 2 minutes. Oh, there are so many opportunities. But I'm telling you, we fumble because we don't we don't prepare. So what do we learn from Paul in Acts? In his testimony, he gives us a good pattern. How do you give a testimony? So first he tells us, what was he or his worldview before he met with Christ? He says, I was, a, I was into Judaism, I was a Judaizer, I was zealous for the law. He tells us who he was before he met with Christ. I was a persecutor of the Christians. Yeah? So when you tell your testimony, the first thing is you need to be clear. What was your worldview before you met with Christ? Who were you before you met with Christ? Then Paul tells us the second thing. How I encountered Christ. He says, on the road to Damascus, I was going to persecute people. On the road to Damascus, I encountered the risen Christ. Hallelujah. And I couldn't see. I fell off my donkey. And there was great light. And I heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting? He says, who are you, Lord? He says, I am Christ, the one you are persecuting. So he tells us how he encountered Christ. Then in that testimony of his in Acts, you should go read it. Then he tells us, now who is he? What has happened now? Hallelujah. And then he tells us, now I'm a preacher of the gospel. So, what was your worldview, your challenges, before you met Christ? How did you encounter Christ? And what has changed since you encountered Christ. Hallelujah. These are the three things that should be there clearly in your testimony. And we need to put some thought. We need to, we need to prepare. There has to be some preparation. So many opportunities are there. But because we are not prepared, we fumble. We waste opportunities. So, if, so now if you ask me, I can tell you three minutes my testimony. Based on this pattern. Before I met with Christ, I had become an atheist. I didn't believe there's a God. Because I used to pray to God that no one used to hear. <laughs> How did I meet with Christ? I was on a train coming from Kerala to Delhi. 
the engine of the train, the Kerala Express, it derailed. And it was a miracle that the bogies didn't fall over. And a woman in the train, me and her had a conversation. I said, we are so lucky. And she said, no, we are not lucky. Christ, the living God, saved us. And then I had a whole conversation with this woman and she shared the gospel with me. And now, after meeting with Christ, can someone switch off your phone, please? That really help. I can't concentrate like this, please. Okay, great. So, and the third thing. So what has happened to me after meeting with Christ? I found meaning and purpose in my life. I have found the true living God who has changed me, who has transformed my internals, who has given me meaning and purpose, joy and peace and rest I never had. Hallelujah. That's all it takes, three minutes. And you can give your gospel effectively. You can give the testament effectively. But we have to prepare. And we have to put some time preparing what is his story. So I tell my story and I tell his story. The story of the cross. That I'll leave it for another time. Yeah? But do think about this, what I'm saying to you, please. It's very important. These shoes are important. And also, you know what? People who are on the front lines of battle, they're active. They're alert. People are constantly sharing the gospel. They're on the front lines of battle. They're alert. They continually find God's... They continually find... They meet with God's pleasure. They share this gospel. When we are passive about sharing the gospel, we are like those soldiers who are sitting in the... They're sitting in the mess in the hall. So there are, off, there are guys fighting on the front and then the people who sit in the headquarters in the hall. For them, the priority is... Aaj kaun sa movie dikhayenge? <laughs> What is, in, what is there for, for food? What movie they show us today? But the fellow right in the front, what's his priority? Man, I need to not get shot. I need to shoot some guys. That's his priority. People on the front lines of battles, the alert, they keep beating the pleasure of God. The guys who are not active in one sharing the gospel, who don't care about wearing these shoes, they're passive. They're not seeing anything much happening. You know, when we don't fight the battles that we're supposed to fight, we get into battles we're not graced for. When we don't fight the battles we're supposed to fight, we get into battles we're not graced for. Mm. Remember about David when he fell with the whole Bathsheba thing? Mm. It says, in the times that the kings went to battle, David got up in the evening. Why are you sleeping the old man? This is, these are the days the kings go to battle. It's conveniently, ah, okay. Jo, jo ab, tu ja ke kaam kar. I have done many battles. I am going to chill. Enjoy the fruit of my labors. Joab, you go fight my battles. And so the Bible tells us, in the, in the times when the kings went to battle, David is lazing around. Gets up in the evening from his bed. Because he's not fighting the battle he's supposed to fight, he gets into a battle he's not graced for. Okay. In addition to all, take up the shield of faith, with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith, the shield of the Roman soldier, was a big rectangular shield. It was supposed to, he could actually hide his whole body behind that. Yeah? So very big, all encompassing shield. Look at this, it's a, it's a, it's a pretty big shield. He can really protect so much of his body here. You can get a good picture of the shield there. And so, but what's the difference between the breastplate of faith and the shield of faith? The breastplate of faith is about 
putting your faith in what the Bible says about the gift of righteousness. The shield of faith is about you putting your faith in God to shield you and everything connected to you. You know, one of the things I found, um, over the years I found that when I would pray for people who were oppressed by demons, I found that there was always, if you didn't really apply the blood well on your loved ones, there was always a counterattack of the enemy. So I am praying for someone and who's oppressed by demons, I find two, three days later my children are sick. Once I, I had the most bizarre experience. I remember praying for a woman who said she was seeing things. And I, and I never forget that. I remember praying for this woman. I, I put my hand and I prayed for her. And I felt something from this woman trying to climb into my hand. Weird. So weird. I'm praying for this person. Something is climbing into my hand through this woman. And I'm just so grateful to God. It came to layer and it went down. And then something from my body filled her, hallelujah. But there was an attack, there was, there was that fight. There was a counter-attack. And so we are being told here that, guys, there is going to, it's a fight. If you are going to mess with the devil, the devil is not going to take it so lying down. So you need that shield, that all-compassing shield. And you, and you hide yourself and everyone connected to you under that big shield. And you fight. So then now, one of the things I, I began to do before I pray for anyone who, who says, I'm seeing weird things or weird things happening, I say, hang on. I say, Lord Jesus, I apply your blood on me, my wife, my kids, everyone in the church, my mom, my dad, everybody, and then you pray. And then I found they are delivered and nothing happens to you and people connected to you. So it's important. These are things that happen. That's the truth. It's a fight. It's a war. There is power in the blood, but that you have to apply the blood by faith to see mm -hmm. the shielding power of the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Remember even the, even the fellows in the, in the Old Testament <laughs> on, the, uh, on the day of Passover, it was not enough for them to just cut the animal, eat that animal. They had to take <laughs> that blood and they had to apply that blood onto the lentils and the doorposts. They had to apply it. And, and in one sense, they had to put their faith in what God had said. God said, today the destroyer is going to pass through. And the destroyer is going to kill every firstborn of the Egyptians. Mm -hmm. But even you guys, if you, if you don't put the blood on the doors and lentils, this destroyer will catch you too. But if you apply this blood on your doors and your lentils, the destroyer will see the blood applied and pass over. These people had to put their faith in what God was saying and do something about it. You know, they were not like, come on, this is a joke. No. <laughs> this sounds weird, God, no. God said it, let's do it. What is, what, what is faith? I will put my confidence in what God is saying. I'll put my trust in what God is saying. Hallelujah. What God has said. And so, for the, on the day of Passover, for the... Israelites to be, the firstborn of the Israelite homes to be saved, they had to apply faith in what God had said about the blood. Amen. It was not enough that you shed the blood. By faith, you had to apply the blood. And likewise for us, also precious ones, it's not enough that the blood of Jesus has been shed. By faith, we need to apply that blood. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then we see the power of the blood at work. So the shield of faith has to do with, it's a big shield. As you are, you have to hide everyone connected to you behind that big shield. Otherwise, you find there's collateral damage that happens. And I also had to learn the hard way. I would, I would, pray, I would go for mission trips, pray for things, come back, and I was to find so many problems with my kids. And then God began to teach me. Now he said, no, you got to apply the, the shed blood of my son by faith on everything connected to you. Hallelujah. So this is a big shield. It's a big shield. And basically the shield of faith is what? Learning to put your confidence in what God has spoken. That's what faith is. 
What is faith? It is learning to put your confidence in what God has spoken about his character in the Bible, but God has spoken about himself, his ways. His promises, you will learn to put your trust and confidence in what God has said. What do you mean walk by faith? I will take my decisions based on putting my confidence in God's wisdom rather than my own wisdom or the wisdom of the world. Isn't it? And take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit which is the word of God. So perhaps we can we can look at the helmet of salvation. So so can you show my Roman soldier? Yeah. You see this fellow, he has a helmet too. The helmet is protection for his head, basically. For us the paddle is the mind. You take the best soldier, if something happens to his mind, he can't use any armor, <laughs> he can't do anything. So the devil works pretty hard on the mind. Yeah. The protection for the heart is faith, the protection for the mind is hope. Hallelujah. The protection for the heart is faith, the protection for the mind is hope. Oh, biblical hope. What is biblical hope? <laughs> You have a sure expectation of good from God. Amen. Doesn't matter what hits you. Because of who your God is. And what is accomplished through Calvary. Hallelujah. Doesn't matter what hits you. You're always expecting deliverance. You're always expecting good from God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because of who He is. And what is accomplished through the cross. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Without it. Without it. Without it. We can't wage war. If I yield to, the devil works over time to bring discouragement, depression, despair to the believer. And the only way to protect this mind from depression, despair, <laughs> is I need a helmet. Where I have, I'm always expecting salvation to be worked out for me. I'm always expecting deliverance to be worked out for me. Hallelujah. And again, if you go to Thessalonians, Paul, Paul tells us about this, about this, uh, Helmet of salvation. He calls it the, the hope of salvation. If we, if we go to again Thessalonians, that same verse please, uh, where we talked about the breastplate. So if you go to <clears throat> 1 Thessalonians 5.8. 1 Thessalonians 5.8 please. For since we are of the day, let us be sober, having put on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. In Ephesians, he calls it the helmet of salvation. Here it calls the hope of salvation. In Hindi, it's, 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 it's very nicely put in the Hindi Bible. Udhar ki asha ki topi pan ke roho. Udhar ki asha. Udhar ki asha ki topi pan ke roho. That means, Always expect, always be expectant of salvation to be worked out in every situation. Always be expectant of deliverance is being worked out for you. Always expect that this God is going to do something for me. Hallelujah. He's going to work out something good for me. Hallelujah. He loves me. He's going to work out something wonderful. Hallelujah. And, and, and we must expect this because of who God is and because of what He's accomplished on the cross. God is good. So he will do good. Hallelujah. Amen. That's who he is. He's, he's just goodness. <laughs> Love. That's who he is. Hallelujah. It's so important. This, and you know, uh, many times, many times, um, I have found that if we are not walking the joy of the Lord, the main reason is we have low levels of hope. Romans tells us the relationship between hope and joy. How can you be joyful when you're depressive? If we have allowed the devil to crush our hope, how can we be joyful? It's, it's an oxymoron, right? First, the levels of hope have to be worked up for us to be able to walk in the joy of the Lord. So there is a clear relationship between joy and hope. And so every time I feel I'm struggling to walk in the joy of the Lord, I realize my levels of hope have been attacked. 
and so I need a fresh injection of hope. hope. Yes. And trust me, we have to learn to give these injections to ourselves because everyone is busy fighting their own battles. So if you're expecting people around you to give it, it's not coming <laughs> so easily. A few, a few gracious believers might give injection from time to time, but eventually we all have to learn how to give injections ourselves. The injection of hope. Yeah. I remember once I preached about this injection of hope, the, the people who called me got confused and said, Are you, were you an engineer or a doctor? <laughs> I said, I was an engineer, but all of us need to learn to give one injection for sure, called the injection of hope. Use the word and give us an injection of hope. Yeah. We've got, we got to learn, man. We've got to learn to lift ourselves up. David had to learn to live himself, to lift himself up. You know, he, he would talk to his own, to himself. Oh my soul, why are you in despair? Why are you so feeling so low, man? Come on, put your trust in God, hope in God. You will again praise Him. Hallelujah. So we got to start to talk to ourselves. Start giving some injections of hope to ourselves. Hallelujah. If you go to Isaiah, Isaiah 61 talks about a spirit of heaviness which is broken by the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. You know, we can rebuke a spirit of heaviness over a person and it makes a remarkable difference to them. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So many times, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people and then the Lord says, you know what, your talk is not just going to help. First you got to rebuke that spirit of heaviness and then you talk. Yes. Hallelujah. Yeah? Yes. Look at this, Isaiah 61.3. We'll, 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 read, we'll read from verse 1. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the afflicted. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and freedom to the prisoners, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, a day of vengeance to a God, to comfort all who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, giving them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of spirit of fainting. The spirit of fainting, the spirit of heaviness. Yeah. We need the oil of? Gladness to deal with the spirit of fainting, mm -hmm. the spirit of heaviness. We need all of gladness. Yes. And the good news is, you can we can rebuke in, in the authority of Christ, we can rebuke the spirit of heaviness over a person. Hallelujah! And really helps them. Mm -hmm. But it's not enough, we have to then teach them how to put on this helmet. Otherwise, they will constantly need somebody to always keep rebuking the spirit of heaviness over them. That's not how you grow in the Lord. Praise God for the mercy of God. But I believe God wants us to learn His ways that we learn to victor and build. Because we have been grounded in the ways of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And you know, very often, when you're being beaten down, God expects you to say just the opposite. In Isaiah, He says, a barren woman shout for Joy. The last thing the barren woman wants to do, shout for? Joy. Joy. So God has a habit of making us say things totally opposite of what we are feeling to say. Yes. Yeah. You know, when I, when I feel discouraged, that's when the Lord says, I want to hear. I am more than a conqueror through Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's when I need to say I am more than a conqueror. And that is what it means, walk by faith. Your senses are saying, man, I'm feeling so sick, man. I'm feeling so low. And God is saying, no, that's not what you're going to say. <laughs> you're going to put your trust in what I say about you. Amen. You are not a loser, you're more than a conqueror. conqueror. God looked at a scared Gideon, what did God say to him? <laughs> Imagine what must have gone through. He must have looked, who are you talking to? <laughs> talking to me? Someone else is there, some mighty man is there. 
You know, that must have been his instinct. You know, what was he doing? This fellow was threshing grain in a wine press. He was so scared. He was hiding in a wine press and threshing grain. He was afraid of the enemies. When God appears and what does God say to him? Oh, mighty man of valor. If I were Gideon, I'd be like, where is that fellow man? Kaya bhai, kaya. Kaya bhai, kaya bhai, kaya pray for me, whoever you are. But that's God. He looks at us and he calls out the finished product that he is seeing. That's amazing. It's amazing. He's just, he's just, he's just a sweetheart. He, he doesn't call out what we are. He calls out what he has seen in his, in his mind. The finished product. Hallelujah. So when you feel, man, I am just such a loser, please don't say that. You got to say what God has said about you. You are more than a conqueror. Hallelujah. That's what who we are. We are highly blessed and favored people. We have to learn to walk by faith. We have to learn to put our confidence in what God has said. Amen. Hallelujah. And very often I have found the Holy Spirit makes me say things totally opposite to what I would feel like saying. God has a sense of humor, doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But his ways are powerful. His ways are so powerful. Hallelujah. David said in one of the Psalms, he said, I think Psalm 27, he says, I would have got depressed if I wouldn't have believed that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. That's powerful, man. David, when he was running from Saul for his life, running, <laughs> hiding in caves and dens, that's when he said this. I would have got depressed if I wouldn't have believed that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Hallelujah. He doesn't say, I might see. The, the, the dude is sure, man, that I will see. Hallelujah. I would have got depressed if I wouldn't have believed that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I say to you, if there's anyone here going through a really tough season, I want to encourage you, please. This is the truth. You will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Amen. This is a passing phase in your life. Amen. We don't get stuck in these phases. Amen. He's a loving dad. He, he, he picks us up and pushes us out of it. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. He's, he's an amazing loving father. Hallelujah. So if you're, if, so if you're that person, I just want to open your mouth and say this, that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And what I'm going through is a passing phase. You can say that right now. That's the truth. That's the truth. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We are passing through. We don't get stuck. You know, even, even in Psalm 84, when, even in Psalm 84, there's this, <coughs> this interesting expression called the Baka, the valley of Baka. And again, it says we are passing through the valley of Baka. But then some people get stuck in Baka, some don't. You know who don't get stuck? Psalm 84 tells us. Those who have committed to their pilgrimage with God, they don't get stuck in the valley of Baka. What is Baka? A place of intense weeping and crying. A season of intense weeping and crying. And Psalm 84 says, those who have committed themselves to the pilgrimage with God, they are not going to get stuck in the valley of Baka. They are going to, in fact, move from strength to strength. And God says, I'm going to tear open the dry ground and send springs of water from below, and I will send rains from above. Hallelujah. Yes. I'm going to, it's like God is saying, I'm going to give an abundance of refreshing. Hallelujah. 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 And there's only one condition. Set your heart on a pilgrimage with me. The most important thing in your life should be your relationship with me. I and my purposes should be the most consuming <coughs> aspiration in your life. And if you're that person, he says, I will not let you remain in the valley of weeping. I'm going to put you out. I'm going to get you out of there. And you're going to go from strength to strength. 
You're going to go from strength to? Strength. Strength. Hallelujah. 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 It gives God pleasure to see us walking in joy. You know, uh, today uh, my, my twins, it's a birthday. Imagine I, I give them a good gift, but I don't see them happy about it. You know, if today I see my kids miserable, man, that's going to break my heart. <laughs> it gives us so much happiness as parents to see our kids enjoying their journey. How much more the Heavenly Father wants to see us enjoying our journey with them, especially after the price His Son has paid, that we can walk in joy. You know, whatever we go through, God wants to see His joy in and through us as a part of our response. And it's possible because happiness depends on happenings. Joy is independent of happenings. Happiness depends on happenings, but joy is independent of <coughs> happenings. The Bible tells us, from where does joy come? In His presence, there is fullness of joy. Things can be falling apart, but because you are making use of the access, the gift of righteousness is open up for you, you're making use of that access, you are finding joy being released to you. The things are falling apart outside. Hallelujah. Because happiness depends on happenings, but joy is independent of happenings. Hallelujah. In my presence, in His presence, there is fullness of joy. In His right hand, the pleasures for ever. Hallelujah. 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 And, and this joy is so much linked up with your levels of hope. And so we so need to learn how to, how to jack up our levels of hope. We can grow in, in walking in, in hope, in putting on this helmet, by feasting on the character of God. That gives us so much hope. By working on the promises of God. You know, you know, I, if you are facing a difficult situation and you cry out to God, either He's going to give you a deliverance or a promise, but He won't be silent. Okay? If you're going through any challenge, any storm, and you cry out to God, either He will give you immediate deliverance or He'll give you a promise. So that the promise can sustain you, strengthen you, as He works out your deliverance. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Promises are so important to walk in hope. There's so much given to protect our mind. So much given to rub His nature on us. God uses promises to distract us back to Himself. <laughs> the storms so often beat us down. And what does God do? He uses a promise to distract us back to Himself. Lift, a, lift our gaze from the problem on Himself. God has already seen the future. <laughs> so what does He do? He gives you, He knows the, the, the future. So He gives you a promise that will help you to get there. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so many times, you know, God gives a promise and we don't work with it. And then we're feeling sick and we say, oh, give me something, Lord. Say something, say something. God saying, I said something one month back. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? Where, do you, where, did, you, where did you leave that? Many times God refuses to give us so many promises specifically for us because very often we have not done justice to what He's already spoken. And God wants us to work with what He gives. But I've seen this. Whenever I have, I, I have a problem and I cry out to God, either there's an immediate deliverance or there's a promise that He'll make big in my heart. And that promise so helps me as a journey, so strengthens, so empowers, so helps you to keep pressing forward in the plans and purposes of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, they're so powerful when God illuminates a promise. And, and, and I said to you a few Sundays back, it's not <coughs> enough to just know the promise. It's very important that we so commune with God over the promise that the Holy Spirit completely assures our heart, this is mine. This is surely happening. This is mine. This is surely going to happen. Hallelujah. Mm. 
and then it's granted to us. Romans 4, didn't we, did we read in Romans 4? Let's go there, please. You know, we all have something in our life. Already, 18, please. Let me say this to you. Um, all right, 18, stop. Either we already have something where we need to hope against hope, or one day we will get something happened to us where we will need to hope against all hope. <laughs> None of us is exempt from this hopeless things. Yeah. In hope against hope, Abraham believed. That means in the natural, there was no hope for it. He had to find his hope only in God. So in hope against hope, against all natural hope, Abraham believed that he might become a father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall your descendants be. Without becoming weak in his faith, he contemplated his own body now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old in the deadness of Sarah's womb. Yet, this, this is interesting, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in his faith, giving glory to God. And being fully assured or being fully convinced that what God had promised, he was able also to perform. Mm. Therefore, it was credit to him as righteousness. You know, this full assurance is an important word when it comes to promise. <coughs> when God gives you a promise, he wants you so much to talk to God over it that it should come out of your pores. In your sleep, you should be saying it. Your heart should be fully convinced. This is mine. Nobody can stop this from happening. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. This, this deliverance is mine. It's happening. Amen. Hallelujah. And God says, when you're fully assured, I'll perform it for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And there's nothing the devil and his team can do about it. And I, I, I've mentioned this to you. You know, when, you know uh, me and Vasu, my wife, we didn't have kids for, we had kids after eight years of marriage. And uh, the doctors told us you can't have kids. And... Uh, so, so for a couple of years, you know, the, you know, the Lord would say, I need you to talk. To you. And the Lord would say, come and read the life of Abraham and encourage yourself. And after about five years of marriage, the Lord actually convinced me that you're going to have kids. And then I remember when I'd go to preach somewhere, he would say, I want you to tell this church, I don't have kids. Doctors told I can't have kids, but we're going to have kids. And I said, the Lord, why don't you tell these people? Can't we have it as our chat? You know? So no, I want you to boast because it's going to encourage many people here. Who are in a similar situation. And I'm telling you, there was a time when my heart got fully assured that God is going to give us children. Okay. And then I began to boast about these children coming. And then we have three boys now. And I still remember the, the doctor said, you can't have kids. He, he, just, he just went berserk when he, when he realized that Vasu can see. Because we said, God has done this. He says, don't talk about God to me, you know. I think he had some problems with God. <laughs> but even he couldn't deny the fact that Vasu was pregnant. They were frustrated that God had messed up all his medical acumen on the issue. Yeah. So, precious ones, this hope, this hope is an anchor for us. In a, in a, in a world that is tough, in a world that is broken down with sin, in a world that's mean, this hope, this biblical hope is an anchor. And it is anchored right in the throne room of God, in the person of Christ. Hallelujah. Christ is an anchor man. Hallelujah. He's, he's got us, you know. <laughs> it's like I got you, man, you know. He's got us through the cross. We just need to now feast on what he's done, how amazing this salvation is. Let's just take some time, precious ones, to think through what I said. We need to close. So, we'll continue next time with the armor again, the few, some, still some more stuff to speak about.